So if you look at the way of Jesus, I'm going to bring this up here. Um, we bring this, thank you. The story of Matthew, in Mark 1, chapter uh, chapter 1, starting at verse 40, where uh, Jesus heals the leper. And I'm not going to read it, but you can follow along if you want to put behind me. But um, if you know about anything about leprosy, it's a terribly contagious disease. Um, and so the, the law was, if you touch someone who was a leper, you became unclean. And they had to watch you and make sure that, that you didn't get, gain it too. But uncleanness was not just about you know disease and contagion. It was rules that kept people in and rules that kept people out. And the wealthier you are, you were, the more likely you were to be clean. And the poorer you were, the more likely you were to be unclean. So most of the people Jesus went to were sort of the people who were unclean for a variety of reasons. So Jesus goes to this leper who, who is in need of healing, and he touches him. And instead of Jesus becoming unclean, what happens? It's the leper who becomes clean. You know, I think there's something wrong with an understanding of God that says, you know what, that which is unclean, which is tainted, if it touches something good, it will make the good unclean. Say, so you know what? If God is all powerful, if God is good, then when God touches something, what happens? God brings healing and wholeness. And so Jesus touches this man and he's made clean. And he says, I want you to go to the priest. And the priest was the one who was in charge of who's in and who's out. And he says, Tell him you're in. And tell him I did it. Right. <laughs> We've been talking about identifying with Jesus, and the way of Jesus was welcoming everybody. He wasn't talking so much about what happens after we die, as much as that might be something we're concerned about and something that's important, he was talking about how do we live in community now? And if everybody is God's children, how do we live that way? And I think we need to wrestle with this because, you know, we haven't done really well. Now, in the Christian tradition, you know, we talked a few weeks ago about the idea of sacred and secular, and that we understand that there is no secular, that everything is sacred. And one of the ways we pick that up is in another story where Jesus in Matthew 25 talks about... Um, and when the final day comes, he said, and God, you know, God is there, it separates the sheep and the goats, right? And um, you can bring that up to you guys. Is that, is that the next one? Uh, thank you. Um, so he puts, keep, click on it a little bit here. Um, one more. So, and one more, I apologize. So he, he says to the sheep, he said, um, Enter, you are blessed by my Father. Take what's coming to you in its kingdom. It's been ready for you since the world's foundation. And here's why. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was homeless, and you gave me a room. I was shivering, and you gave me clothes. I was sick, and you stopped to visit. I was in prison, and you came to me. And those are going to say to you, well, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and come to you? And he will say, you know, whenever you did it, one of these things, to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. Or in Hebrews 13.2. I love this one too. Like this. Next one, guys. You ready with a meal or a bed when it's needed. Why, some have extended hospitality to angels without even knowing it. You know, we've been talking about these three things that are central to us as church of, of identifying with Jesus, about um, understanding that God is everywhere, that there's no secular or sacred, everything is sacred, and about living in this community. We want to look at what does that really mean? And part of it is understanding that breaking down that sacred secular split and saying every single person you meet, you touch God. It's like you entertain angels unaware. And it's interesting, it doesn't say the people we most likely are going to be kind to, a family or our friends, you know. It says who are the people you see angels in? Strangers. The people you yeah, overlook, ignored, people who, who don't fit in, that you meet God in them. You know, I think as a church often we've been kind of um, We've been a bit arrogant. We think we understand everything. We've got this agenda, right? The whole idea is, kind of what you heard that first scene, is we've got to get people into heaven, right? Especially those who aren't Christians. And so we, that's, that's our agenda. That's what we go out for. It's like, you know, not just in the belt is what we've often seen. And, and it makes us a bit arrogant because we know the answer and we're going to tell everybody. And what happens when you do that? Well, if you watch a scene from Gandhi, you know what? Um, what a, one of the major things that turned him away from, from Christianity was Christians. It was those white folks who were Christians who were throwing people off the train. And if you saw it, where were the white folks going? They, they got off and they were walking through the, you know, the nice part of the station and they were all dressed up. And the people who weren't, they were poor, tattered clothes, and they just had to kind of find their way. You know, we've, we've, we've made these divisions. So we need to be a little more humble. <laughs> I think humility is important to say, you know what? Maybe we don't always know all the answers. We, we, need to be, we need to be a little more humble and be able to admit we don't have all the answers. And then we could talk with other people. Maybe we might want to listen to things that they have to say, too. 
Um, you know, the other thing too is to realize, even within our own community here, I mean, this is a place where no one is excluded. And I think we, we, we try to live that way. We have people I know here who probably vote Democrat every election and people who vote Republican every election, right? right? And then we say, we're here because we understand that, that we all belong, that God loves us, and so we can be diverse and we can talk about who we are because is there anything we can say that's going to exclude us? You know? Now, we're not perfect, and we're going to fail sometimes, but I know many of us have been in journeys of things that, that have, of brokenness, of we struggled with with um, drug and alcohol issues. You know, some of us have, have been in, in, in journeys where we've been in trouble with the law and, and all kinds of things. And other of us, we just look good on the outside. <laughs> all right, we've all been there, and so we understand. Saying, you know what? It's okay to be who we are. And I've other people say, you know what? I was able to share because I I shared with them and they just accepted me. They they didn't turn me away. And, and this is central. I mean, for me, I would have been in the church if, if when my father died, if the pastor of the church had said, well, you can't have your finger there, you've never come here. You know, what he did was say, you know what, let me just walk this journey with you. I want to be with you and your family in this difficult time. And I think I'm, I'm here partly because of that, because of that person who just welcomed us no matter where we were. We also need to be a safe place, right? There's a great scene in the movie Philadelphia where Tom Hanks is... is um, talking about his, his job and how he was, he was a, man, a, a gay man and he didn't, he didn't share it with them. And people asked him, well, why didn't you share it? And he shared about um, a time when he was with them when they were making jokes about gay people. And he says, you know what? So um, they said, how did you feel? He says, well, I was relieved. I was relieved. Yeah, but I hadn't shared anything with them. How many of you have been with people where there's something about your journey that you thought about sharing and then somewhere along the line they shared something where you knew that you just couldn't share that? You know, I have people saying that, like, oh, I can't believe some people who do that. And I'm like, oh, I've done that. <laughs> I'm not telling you about that then because, yeah, I know it's not safe. You know, we need to be a safe place where we can share who we really are and not have to hide it. All right? You know, it doesn't mean we have to share everything, but to know that, that this is a place where that's not going to keep us out. The other thing is, I think Christians get really wrapped up in our agenda. I mean, we think we, you know, a lot of, like Rob Bell's books, people are so wrapped up. And that what it's all about is getting people out of hell. And most people are going there, and our agenda is to get them out of there any, by any means necessary, you know, and, and whatever it takes, you know, and we just run them over if we need it so that we can save them. And not only is that a bit arrogant, but, you know, I think it doesn't work, you know. We do apologetics trying to prove that God is God, and if we prove it to people, then they're going to change. And I remember one of my uh, college professors, who was the head of the religion department, and he said, you know, people talk about defending the Bible. He says, the Bible can take care of itself. And I think God can too. I mean, we, you know, we need to thank God or God take care of God's self. Maybe we need to be open to the fact that we might learn something from somebody else. You know, we think of evangelism, we've got, you know, there's trainings you can go through and the, the, the points you have to make to people in the corner on the street corner like Bullhorn guy. But I think St. Francis had it much more right, you know, about preaching the good news in these words only if necessary. Or as, as I shared about my journey to India with um, Lutheran World Relief, how they said they didn't go in giving their spiel because people knew the only agenda you had was to convert them. You didn't really care about them. But when they came in to just help people and didn't have to give them their spiel, and people said, you know, you really care about me. There must be something about this God you serve, and I want to know more. I think that's the kind of community we want to be. And I think we need to think about it in terms of how we deal with religions as well. Because so often we've treated other religions in one of two ways. Either they're absolutely wrong, or they're absolutely just as right, because our religion is absolutely just as right. And either way, we're always absolutely just as, as, as right. You know, in the one way we exclude people, and the other we don't really ever deal with things because we don't talk about any things where there's differences. You know, one of the things that was very um, helpful for me was my journey with wrestling with Gandhi. Because I can remember folks in college saying, you know what, Gandhi was sent by Satan to deceive people from following Jesus. Like, and I remember my internship supervisor goes, you know, I remember, he says, when I first found Gandhi, he was like, hmm, looks like Jesus, tastes like Jesus. Now, it's not Jesus, but God is obviously moving here. And, and to reject that, it's like, you know, it's, it's from Satan. And it was interesting to me, and actually being open to what Gandhi had to say, you know, to see that maybe there's some good news, maybe there's a, there's a, you know, a gospel here, and it might help me to see something new. And I found to be the case that there are places I've gone, and Gandhi helped me to see Jesus better in many ways than some other folks. But I also found that even in opening there, that, that suddenly Jesus became even more important, that I realized there were things about Jesus that I couldn't find anywhere else, not even in Gandhi. Right? And, and it helped me to see that was most central. And when we journey with people, and we can be open to what they have to share as well, then maybe they might be open to us. But if we're entering into the agenda, my whole agenda is to convert them or get them into church, then y'all meet people like that. You know that as soon as you meet them, don't you? 
What we want to be is a, a people that are just simply about God's kingdom, uh, about what Jesus was about, about people being included, about people being welcome, about being on a journey of faith together, whether we're all Christians or not. And who knows what God's spirit might be doing in the midst of that. You know, I think the meal is a central place that we need to remember. The, one of the words for communion is Eucharist, and it has to do with Thanksgiving. This is to give thanks for what God has given. But also the word communion. And in um, Paul's writings, he talks about this meal. And it was interesting to me how the church used to use this passage where it talks about, you know, many have, have, uh, have eaten the meal without recognizing the body. And so they, they, they condemn themselves. And, and, and so churches thought, whoa, they didn't see Jesus was really present here. They're condemning themselves. They're going to be going to hell. So we've got to be careful and only let people who are really ready get it. So when I went through church, you know, you had to go through confirmation classes and you had to be interviewed by people on the council to make sure you were ready before you could come up and have communion. And scholars actually began to look at the passage and what it said in the context and realized that they were saying something very different. That what was really going on was that people were gathered together at the church and they would always have the big meal. Remember we talked about that when they would get together? And they were starting the meal before some folks showed up, especially the folks that were like at the Ronald Miller kind of table, right? You know, who were the wrong kind of folks. So the, the wealthy folks would come and they would eat and they would pick out and they would drink all the wine up and they, they'd finish the meal all drunk and, you know, and saying things they shouldn't be saying. And other folks who couldn't get there to late, even especially those who were slaves, they wouldn't have anything and they'd go away hungry. And so when Paul says, don't you realize you're not seeing the body of Jesus, he's not talking about seeing Jesus in the bread and the wine, he's seeing, seeing Jesus in the people in the community. And if you've left people out, excluded them, and you, you've been a glutton and left them without anything to eat, you're not living as if this is the body. And that's where the judgment is. He said, you need to live as if everybody is in the body. Last thing I'm going to finish with is... Uh, there's a parable Jesus talks about uh, of the wheat and the tares. I don't know if you've ever heard this, but it's a story about this guy who plants his wheat in the ground, and, and during the night, one of his enemies comes and he plants tares, which is a weed that looks like wheat when it starts out. Right? And you can't tell until the harvest. And often this, this parable has been told to, to talk about how, you know, judgment is coming. And that's a discussion for another time. Um, but it's very interesting to me that the guy says, you know what, we're going to leave off harvesting pulling those weeds out, because if we do, we can't tell the difference. We'll probably pull out wheat, you know. We wait till the end. You know, I think we it, it often, especially those in the church, have thought we can decide who the wheat and the tares are right now. We can figure it out, right? And part of the story is saying, you know what, you don't know who's in or who's out or how God's working. You know what, you just need to live in the way Jesus lived and let God worry about those things, you know. And that's not something we're going to see in the here and now. So I think for us as a community, if we want to talk about welcoming a stranger, it's very important that we, that we simply see that each person is Jesus' presence with us, that we might be entertaining angels unaware. We need to act that way to people and leave everything else up to God. Um, I said it was done, but i, I got to share one last thing because I think this is important too. It needs to be part of all of our lives. And you know, one of the things that's interesting to me is you know, in the Old Testament, God says to the Israelites, he says, you know what, you were, you were strangers, you were aliens, you were immigrants in Egypt, so you need to welcome the stranger, the alien, and the immigrant. And I think we need to wrestle with this as a church, because, you know, we often get into this discussion, especially in our community, where uh, uh, we have a fifth of our community are immigrants, and probably 80% are not here documented. And I don't know what all that means, but to wrestle with, what does it mean that we're called to welcome those who are strangers, and immigrants, and aliens? And while I don't know the answers to all these questions, um, we are called be people who welcome strangers. This is kind of the first half of, of, of the discussion we're going to finish next week because when we're talking about welcoming, we're often thinking about people who come to us or the people we meet where we are normally. Next week, we want to talk about serving with generosity. But remember that we're also called to go out to where people are at and to serve others as if they were Jesus, to see in them uh, angels we might be entertaining unaware. And I want to invite us to explore that together uh, more fully next week. Um, but would you, uh, would you pray with me?